Welcome to Riverbank Zoo. I'm Megan Sear, and today we're going to step behind and look at one of animals' amazing adaptations. Now, an adaptation can be anything physical or behavioral an animal has to help it survive. Today, we're going to look at some animal tails, so follow me. at Riverbank Sioux with Steph Taylor, our senior keeper, and we've got some of our awesome farm animals with us. Now, who are these guys? This is Betsy. She's our New Jersey calf, and she's about six months old, and she comes from a farm in Orangeburg. Ah, so she's going to get a lot bigger. Yeah, she get up to about a thousand pounds. Ooh, wow. Yeah. How tall does these guys get? Oh, she probably get about four and a half to five feet tall okay. at the ridge of their back there. And then this is Rain Man, and yes. he's a? Llama. Uh, and these guys, he's been here the longest. Yes, he's been here, ooh, about 15 years. Now, farm animals, a lot of them use their tails in a lot of different ways, but Jersey cows and horses and all those guys, how do they use their tails? Well, horses and cows also use their tails to swat insects mm -hmm. or either just for balance and so forth because their tails are longer. Mm -hmm. So mostly for fl swatting flies. So bugs and insects can have a lot of problems for flies. Nobody likes being bitten by insects and this mm -hmm. is their way of keeping them away. Exactly. Perfect. And then llamas are a little different. Their tail's a lot shorter. Yeah. So what would a llama use his tail for? He would use it to send signals to other llamas in the pasture when they're chasing off predators and so forth. And he uses it to show signs of aggression or happiness. So they send different types of signals with their tails. So just like a dog, everyone knows what a dog's feeling mm, when, when he's, he's wagging, wagging his tail. Exactly. So their tail actually helps send signals as well. Right. Well, very interesting. Thank okay. you so much, Steph. And, and we'll so head welcome. out to another area of Riverbank Zoo. It's not just our farm animals that use their tails to swat flies away. Exotic animals do the same thing. If we jump continents and go over to Africa and check out our African plains, you'll see giraffes, elephants, and zebras all use their tails in the exact same way. All right, we have jumped over the moat and we're in Lemur Island right now with Windsor, our lemur keeper and small mammal keeper here at Riverbank Zoo. And Lemurs are pretty special, but what kind of animals are they? Lemurs are actually primates. They are native to the island of Madagascar. Uh, that is the only place in the entire world that you're going to find them. And they are actually a prosimian, which is not a monkey and it's not an ape. A prosimian is a, a special type of primate that have different characteristics that distinguish them from apes and monkeys. They have longer snouts with wet noses because they rely much more on olfactory communication. Uh, they have what's called a grooming claw. Uh -huh. They have a lucidum tapetum, or tapetum lucidum, excuse me, uh, that is actually the reflective layer in the back of the eye that allows for nocturnal vision. So these are what make them unique and different from monkeys and apes. Very cool. Now, yeah. they've got some pretty awesome tails, and they're one of the longest. How big yes. are they? They are pretty long. They are actually longer than their body length, uh -huh. and they actually have a certain number of black to white stripes. So they have about 12 to 13 white stripes and 13 to 14 black stripes. And it corresponds with how many vertebrae they actually have. That's really cool. It I is. Any of yeah. That. Are it's all lemurs have the same tails? No, they don't. The actual ringtail lemur, which is these guys, uh -huh. are the only ones with this black and white coloration. All other lemurs have tails, but they're either fluffier, a little bit shorter, maybe thinner, fur, and things like that. So these guys are the coolest looking and the most, you know, the one you think of when you think of lemur. You think of a ringtail lemur. Now they've got this yeah. beautiful shape on their tail. Why do they have to have that shape, especially when they're walking around? Right. This is called an S curve, mm -hmm. and this is the curve that is created in the tail when they're actually walking. So the communication is there. So they can see their other members of their troop ahead of them when they're walking. So this is really important. And it's also, not only is it a visual cue, but it's also an olfactory cue, a scent cue. And so they can tell which members of their group are in front of them by the scent alone. So they yeah. they have that really strong sense of smell and really cool tail. Now we have three lemur lemurs in this yes. troop, and yes. who are they? We have Maud, who is our matriarch. They, li they live in a matriarchal society, uh -huh. so female dominated. She is right here. Uh, she is actually 25 years old. 
so they can live to be almost 30. Wow. Yeah. Now who's this so right this here? This is Paikia. This is her son. Now, boys do something a little different than yes. lemurs. They do call stink fighting. Stink What's fighting. that? It is only found in ringtail lemur males. Uh -huh. And it is a really cool behavior that they do whenever they feel maybe threatened. If another group of male ringtails are coming into their family group, they'll actually perform this really cool behavior called stink fighting. You're right. They have scent spurs on their inner wrist. Hi, Prakia where they actually rub it on their tail. Either they pull their tail above their head or they pull it to the side and they wave it at their other opponent. <laughs> it's really funny, yeah. So their tails are not only communication, but also a way of fighting and That's saying right. back off. Right, right. Very cool. Well, Very thank you good. so much, Windsor. Thank you, our ringtails, for joining us today. the exhibit this time and we're in the tamarind exhibit. Now what are tamarinds? Tamarinds are monkeys. Uh, tamarinds are native to Central and South America. Uh -huh. The ones that we have here, this is a golden lion tamarind <laughs> that you have on your shoulder right now. These guys are native only to Brazil and we also have a golden headed tamarind in here. They have a black body fur and gold accents and they're also native to Brazil. And they are jumping all over the yes. place. They are very very arboreal. Yes. Arboreal means that you spend more of your time up in the trees. So these guys do. These guys have a nice long tail that helps them with balance when they're running really fast through the tree branches. And so that's really good for them. And so it's very effective. It's about double the length of their body. So almost like a foot long. It's lots very, of balancing. In lots of balancing. Yes. Very cool. Now, as I said, they're all above us right now. Yes, they are. And they don't go on the ground almost at all. They're not terrestrial, they're all arboreal. Right, so terrestrial meaning you spend a lot of time on the ground. Uh -huh. These guys don't. They will only if they see something that they really, really want, and they'll go down and get it. But otherwise, they spend all their time on the ground. They feel safe in the trees. Now, we have we met persimmons earlier. Yes. These are monkeys. What's yes. the other kind of uh, primate? So we got persimmons, uh -huh. which includes lemurs and lorises and even the tarsier. Uh -huh. We've got monkeys that includes the tamarind. We have howler monkeys and saki monkeys and things like that. But we also have apes. Uh -huh. Apes are different. There are apes that are great apes, and then there are kind of like a lesser ape, which are our Siamix that we have here. So yeah, there so are the different. best way to tell the difference between a monkey and an ape yes. is that apes don't have tails. Yes. And monkeys do. Monkeys do. There's only one exception. It's the Barbary macaque. They actually do not have tails, but they are still a monkey. Very cool. Now, yeah. these guys, when you think of monkeys, you think of prehensile tails. What is a prehensile yes. tail? Prehensile means being able to grasp or grip. They can actually hold their entire body weight up with their tail, where they're using their hands to grab things. So it's really effective and very, very cool adaptation for and living in the trees. And I've heard they actually do something really cool with their tail when they sleep. They can actually, if they're on something that's a little unstable or a small little branch, they can actually use that to hang on to another branch to keep them stable and also hold on to their mate. That sounds like pretty cool. Yes. All right, so we've got lots of tails in the tunnel. We're going to go to one more spot. All right, our last stop in the conservation tunnel is with our squirrels. And this yes. doesn't look like a normal squirrel at all. He's very colorful. What is he? She is. Her name is Puffin, and she is actually a Preva squirrel. She's native to Southeast Asia, uh -huh. and so she is very rare. Um, she's very cool, as you can see, with its really neat colorations that she has. Um, she has this black back with the white stripe down the side, and then the orange belly, and that really cool puffy tail. Yeah. Now, squirrels are definitely arboreal animals. Yes. They are by no yes. way terrestrial. And we have squirrels in our backyard that use their tails the same way these guys That's do. That's right. That's right. These, she is arboreal. You're yeah. right. She spends all of her time in the trees. There are ground squirrels, but that this is a tree squirrel. And so she uses that tail to help jump through the branches and helps as a rudder when she's in the air, when she's leaping from branch to branch. And I heard they can jump six feet between trees. Yes. They are great leapers. And they also have really sharp claws that help them when they're going downward down a tree. And so they can use that tail to help guide them I also and the claws to hold on. As a parachute when they're coming down. Yeah. So if you've ever seen a squirrel kind of slip and yes. go down, 
that parachute helps too. That's right. So if for any reason she loses her balance and she starts to descend, she can use that fluffy tail to help slow down her momentum so she doesn't come crashing down to the ground. That's awesome. Yeah. So we have lots of balancers and mm -hmm. just like we had a cool way of sleeping with the heller monkeys, yes. these guys kind of use their tail for something cool when they're sleeping too. That's right. Because it is so fluffy and sometimes it might be in a colder climate, they can use it to wrap around their body and keep them warm. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's also, you know, animals almost across the board, they use their tails as communication also. And so she also uses it as communication with other squirrels. You know, she could shake her tail at another squirrel to let her know that she's a little agitated, or you know, even to, you know, show, hey, I actually want to be friends with you. So, yeah. So next time you're in your backyard, check out your squirrels and what their tails are telling you. All right, we are here in our bird aviary with our bird keeper, Christine, and what kind of birds do we find in this aviary? Well, we have two superb starlings, two golden-breasted starlings, one buffalo weaver, and two Lady Ross's taraco, and they're all found in Africa. What kind of habitat do we find these birds in? Well, the taracos especially are found in the rainforest of Africa, and they're really built to live in the rainforest. They're bright and colorful, they have short wings and long tails, and they're going to maneuver around all those trees. And we are talking about tails today, so tell me a little bit more about their tails. Well, as you can probably notice on those birds, they have the tail about the length of their body, and that's going to help them not only to control their speed, it's going to help them to steer as they're maneuvering through those tough branches in the rainforest. It's also going to help them to balance themselves as they're hopping from branch to branch. So these birds will not only fly, but they'll hop as well, and that tail is really going to help them balance. All right, and I saw when they were flying and, and landing, their tail spread out really far. What's that for? It's actually going to help to slow them down sometimes. They'll spread their tail out and slow them down before they hit that perch so they don't go toppling over. That's why we never see birds run into trees. Yes. That tail helps a lot. It does. Well, we have a lot of different birds here and we're going to go check out some of the other ways birds use their tail. We have flown over to our birdhouse and met with Lisa, another one of our bird keepers here at Riverbank Zoo. And what exhibit are we in right now? This is Large Asia in our birdhouse. In our birdhouse. And, uh, large Asia would have Asian birds. That's right. So and what do we have in here? Well, we have a variety of birds in here. We have some birds all the way from New Guinea to Indonesia as well. And we have uh, large pigeons in here, which actually are commonly mistaken for peacocks. Um, they do have little similarities. Um, but also, birds as small as little common shaman thrushes, and then our magnificent Regiana birds of prey. Uh, now the birds of paradise, those are definitely the ones we're, we're really uh, attentive to today and it's because of their tails. And you've got a couple of their feathers. That's right. Um, these are actually molted out tail feathers. Uh -huh. They do molt their feathers every year and I like to collect them because they're just beautiful feathers. They are gorgeous. And they're known for their gorgeous feathers. That's right. And I mean these birds are so well known. Um, in the late 1800s um, they were actually captured for their tail feathers because they were used often in hats. But luckily in the 1900s people realize this and the birds are protected now. So their numbers are coming back up now. Yeah, that's right, absolutely. Now why does he need such gorgeous tail feathers? Well these are, um, they're not used to help him in flight in any way, but they do help him in his courtship display. So courtship display means saying, hey, good looking at the girls, huh? That's right. Now the girls don't have the feathers though. No, they do not. They don't look the same. They're um, almost like a brown color, kind of a dull color. The birds are kind of elusive, the females are, um, but the males, they are just very gorgeous. So what do they do to attract a girl? Um, they'll go into a whole vocalization, they'll flip upside down and they'll fan out those feathers, just <laughs> like that. So it's like, hey, look at all the pretty feathers. That's kind of right. like what a peacock does. Yep, absolutely. We have stepped behind scenes and we are here with Scott Poff, curator of herpetology in our propagation room, behind scenes as I said, and we're talking about rattlesnakes. So what kind of rattlesnakes do we have here at Riverbank Zoo? Well we have a number of different species, all the species found in South Carolina. Diamondbacks, biggest rattlesnake in the world, up to eight feet long. Timber rattlesnakes, their close cousin, the canebrake rattlesnake, and the smallest rattlesnake, the pygmy rattlesnake. But we also have the highly endangered Aruba Island rattlesnake, which is only found on the island of Aruba. There are actually 80 different types of rattlesnakes found from Canada all the way down to Argentina. Wow, it's a lot of rattlesnakes. And the rattle is what makes them a rattlesnake. Right. So what is the rattle for? Well, they're unique in the snake world in that they have a sound-making device that uses a defensive mechanism to warn off predators and, and other animals that might step on them. We think that rattlesnakes evolved in central Mexico 
and they evolved the rattle in response to big bovine animals like buffalo that might step on them. So they would rattle to tell the buffalo, hey, I'm here, please don't step on me. Now, interestingly enough, they don't rattle when big predators are around. They rely on their camouflage to hide themselves. They don't want to give their position away. I've never had a wild rattlesnake rattle at me before I actually disturb the animal. Once I try to catch it and do something with it, then it rattles saying, please leave me alone. But otherwise, they try to be silent when predators are around. Big animals that might step on them, they rattle saying, hey, I'm here, please don't step on me. So it's really a good thing that rattlesnakes rattle because it says, oh, that's a rattlesnake, oh, I need to back up and right. not accidentally step on them. Right. Now, these are called buttons on a rattle. Well, what is that? there is a, a rattle is made out of dried uh, segments of skin. So each time a rattlesnake sheds its skin, it adds a segment to the base of the rattle. It's born with a button, which is the very first one on the top. Mm -hmm. Now, each time it sheds, it adds a new rattle. Now, the, the rattles are actually loosely connected, and you can actually pull them apart. And you can see how they form. And when the snake, which has very special muscles in the end of its tail that allows it to rattle really fast, it makes that classic buzzing sound. Ah, now these guys, there's no formula. I can't count the buttons and go, oh, the snake is five years old because he has five buttons. E exactly, each time the snake sheds, it adds a segment to the rattle. They could shed four or five times a year. They could shed once or twice a year. That depends on how old the animal is, how warm it is, how much food it's getting, a lot of variables. So you can't tell how old a rattlesnake is by counting the rattles. And also, because it shakes it back and forth, it sometimes throws off segments of rattles, and then they just have a couple left until they shed more to add segments to it. Now, I've also heard some snakes that don't have rattles that'll still shake their hair to try to pretend or mimic that they're rattlesnakes. A lot of our non-venomous snakes, like rat snakes and king snakes, also vibrate their tail. Now, if their tail is in dried grass or leaves, it makes a characteristic buzzing sound. So that's why we think that rattlesnakes evolved this rattle in response to that. They already could shake their tail, but now they added a noisemaker to the end of it that makes it really loud to keep that big buffalo from stepping on it. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And we are going to go to another animal after hearing the loudest tail here at Riverbank Zoo. All right, so now we've gotten into kangaroo walkabout with Allison, our hoofstock keeper, and we've got a couple of different animals, not just kangaroos in here. We do, we actually have red kangaroos and we also have red-necked wallabies. Okay, and what's the difference between a kangaroo and a wallaby? Because they're just size, basically. Well, they're very similar animals, but the kangaroos are actually a lot bigger mm -hmm. and they're from a little bit warmer regions than the wallabies would be. So the wallabies are fully grown in this exhibit. Our red kangaroos are actually young. They're about three to four years old and they're still growing. The male, when he's full grown, is gonna be about my size. Wow, that's a tall kangaroo. And of course, tall kangaroos have to have long tails. They do. So how long are their tails? Um, it's said that a full-grown kangaroo's tail is about 42 inches. Okay, and wallabies being smaller, they're about? About 28. Okay, 28 and 42, it's a pretty long tail. And they, we've been talking a little bit about balances, but they don't just use their tail for balance. They use their tail for? Um, they use it as a directional machine. So when they're running, uh, their tail is actually not touching the ground. They're actually using it more as a rudder. Uh, so it's actually how they're changing their direction when they're running away from something or towards something if they see food. <laughs> and when they're fat, they are really fast. Mm -hmm, they are. They get up to about 30 miles per hour, and I've heard they can jump 25 feet. Mm -hmm, and that 25 is a to lot 30. farther than I can go. <laughs> um, but not just that, but we also have that when they're moving around, they don't, they use it kind of like a cane, like support. So they're really uh, pretty fast, pretty far jumpers, mm -hmm. and that tail becomes very important. Thank you very much, Allison. You're welcome. All right, we are behind scenes in our education building with our education and farm keeper, Sarah Lusk. And we've got our bearded dragons out for a little bit of enrichment. Now, where are bearded dragons from? They're from Australia, typically the inland areas. Um, they're arboreal animals, so they're not usually seen around water. Um, they love to climb trees, uh, but we have them here in our enrichment pool so they can get some exercise, and it also helps with their shedding. So normally we find them up in the trees, and they're using their tails when they're up in their trees mostly for balance, like That's a lot right. of the animals we see yep. today. But when they're swimming, it's not for balance at all. No, nope, they use it just like a crocodile would. So crocodiles and alligators, bearded dragons, when they're swimming, use their tail like a rudder. 
They do. So it kind of works to help them move. That's right. And, and they can also, they have a really neat feature about them. They can take in air to help them become buoyant so they can float. Yes, they are floating. They're very big right now, all puffed up. Um, and these guys, their tails are pretty much the same length as their body. So they've got a nice long tail. Helps them for balance and for swimming. That's right. Very cool. Well, thank you very much. And we are going to go check out another area. Welcome to the aquarium. We're with Jennifer Rawlings, manager of the aquarium. And we are in front of a pretty cool tank. Who's back here? Well, we have some fish that you could find locally in our South Carolina waters. We have some yellowtail snapper, some silvery looking fish that are called look downs. Mm -hmm. We have burfish, which are kind of like a type of puffer. And we've also got sea robins and flounder, which like to hang around the bottom of the exhibit. Now, tails aren't just good for on land. Tails are really helpful in the water, too. What are these animals using their tails for? They use those tails for a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. They can be designed for speed, so they can give a real quick burst of energy and allow a fish to go really fast. They can also act as a stabilizer, so it helps that fish stay right where it needs to be in the water. Okay, and we don't actually call them tails. What are these different flippers called, or different fins? Right, the tail fin on a fish is called a caudal fin. The tail, I mean the fin on the back of the animal is called the dorsal fin. Uh -huh. And then if you kind of think in humans that our shoulders are pectoral uh -huh. muscles, that they also have pectoral fins that help them with moving around. Very cool. And you said speed. So what are the record speeds in the water? There are some amazing swimmers. Marlin and sailfish can go up to 70 miles an hour. Well, thank you very much. And we're going to go check out another area. We are behind the scenes again in the Aquarium Reptile Complex with Sean Foley, our herpetologist. And these guys are awesome. They're leaf-tailed geckos. And if I got it right, there's 14 species of leaf-tailed geckos that we know about. Correct. Right now, there's 14 species that are described, but there's many species that are uh, going to be described. They've got uh, specimens in hand, and so there's going to probably be over 20 species eventually described. Now, what type is this? This is the giant leaf-tailed gecko. Uh, obviously one of the biggest ones, yes. that's the name. Um, so they get about a foot long. And where are they from? All leaf-tailed geckos are from Madagascar, uh, the island off of the southeast coast of Africa. Now are they terrestrial or arboreal? Now these guys are completely arboreal. Uh, these, these guys like to live on trees, so they're gonna be uh, several meters off the ground usually. And what kind of habitats are we looking at? Well, you're looking at primary rainforest for most of these species. Some of them they've found in secondary, a little altered, but most of them like pristine primary rainforest, which there's very little of. Mm. Well, their homes are pretty special to them, but their tails, they use them in so many different ways, and they're kind of a funny shape. Is there anything particular they want to use that tail for? Well, they use this tail for all kinds of things. It's a it's actually kind of a communication device for one thing. They will use it kind of waves like a flag and at, they're nocturnal, so at night if you come in here and they're at, when they're active, you'll see this tail. When they see a prey item, it'll wave kind of like a flag. When they interact with other males and females and things like that, they'll wave that tail as a flag also. So it, it has a lot of uses. Now they're also good jumpers. So when they're jumping, the tail's important. They are good jumpers and we think, you know, they, they'll jump from tree to tree. And so they can use this tail kind of as a rudder. It can go, you know, kind of help guide them from tree to tree. And when we think of tails and prehensile, meaning grabbing on and using as a second hand, we always think of monkeys, at least I always think of monkeys, but these guys actually have a true prehensile tail too. They, it is semi-prehensile. Um, you see when you go like that, that tail starts curling around your finger. Um, I don't know exactly why, it probably just gives them a little extra purchase when they're um, climbing from tree to tree, but sometimes that tail will you know, completely curl around a, a person's finger and, and they'll hold on a little bit like that, so it's kind of cool. Make sure they don't fall, make mm -hmm. sure that wind doesn't shake them in the trees, and then escaping. If they wanted to get away from a predator, the tail becomes really important. Very important, and now these are a lot different from the lizards that we have here around in South Carolina where their tails can break off in sections. Uh, these leaf-tailed geckos, it's their whole tail actually breaks off. It can't break off in sections, so it's going to, at this joint right here at the base, the whole tail comes off. It's not, it's not piecemeal, and that will help them escape a predator. If a predator grabs onto that tail, the whole tail is going to come off, and then that lizard can escape. 
and they do regenerate the tails. It won't be quite as um, long and beautiful as this one, but they do regenerate. Now these guys are excellent camouflagers, and of course, if a predator found them, they would be able to escape by dropping the tail or jumping away, but they're gonna first try to hide and blend in. Is the shape of the tail helping them to blend in? Yeah, this, these geckos are just masters at camouflage. Their whole body is used for camouflage. You can see this fringe um, that runs along underneath the jaw and it runs all along their bodies, along their legs, and then it goes basically to their tail. And so when they're up against a tree, they lay flat up against a tree and that fringe is gonna splay out, that tail's gonna be flat and it's gonna break up that gecko's pattern on the tree and it's very, very difficult to see that animal when it's, on, when it's completely camouflaged on that tree. So the idea is if I'm staring at a tree and I just see this little bump, it wouldn't be able to see that that's actually the shape of a gecko because they're so splayed out. Right, they're splayed out, there's no shadow, everything's flattened out and uh, they blend in really, really well. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for joining us with Riverbanks Roundup and seeing some of the amazing ways animals use their tails. Join us next time and have a wild day.